Welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar hosted by the Organization Development and Change and Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State. Today, we have the great pleasure of welcoming our presenter, Dr. Michelle Newhart. My name is Jenny Lee, and I'm a PhD candidate in Workforce Education and Development Program. We also have Sagan Giri with us today, who will be managing chat feature and Q&A session. In terms of the interactive format for this webinar, please open the chat feature in the Zoom platform to interact. If you have any questions about the presentation, please use Q&A feature on Zoom. You can see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Click the Q&A button and write your questions. The Q&A session will be at the end of the presentation. Our online Master of Professional Studies in Organization Development and Change can help you prepare to implement quality and continuous improvement initiatives in an organization. Furthermore, there is a PhD program in Workforce Education and Development with a concentration in Human Resource Development and Organization Development. Our program has created a continuous monthly webinar series with experts around the world. Today, we welcome Dr. Michelle Newhart. Dr. Newhart has a PhD from Penn State in Workforce Education and Development, where she studies organization development and appreciative inquiry. After spending 26 years in learning special projects and talent development at Penn State, she joined the talent development team at Colorado State University in 2016. Dr. Newhart is an adjunct professor for Penn State's College of Education, and she designs and teaches graduate courses for World Campus at Penn State. She has been a seasonal team building facilitator in outdoor education, as well as an organization development consultant. She is also a certified life and mentor coach and a Gallup certified strength coach. Her independent company offers positive change initiatives and strengths-based coaching based on appreciative inquiry methodology. Dr. Newhart has published work on appreciative inquiry, succession planning, work family balance, and job burnout. Here's Dr. Newhart. Thanks so much for that introduction, Jenny. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about appreciative inquiry. And I want to thank you and Sagan for supporting this webinar, as well as Dr. Donahue for inviting me to speak today. So as we get started, I'm curious about what the audience thinks when appreciative inquiry comes up as a topic. So please tell us in the appropriate space, uh, one word that comes to mind when you hear appreciative inquiry. So I'll give you a few seconds here to share with us your one word that arises when you hear appreciative inquiry. Sagan, what are you seeing? Uh, I'm seeing words like strengths, curious, positive, openness, positive, gratitude, heart, uh, discovery, hope, goodness, respect, reflecting, all uh, of those. Those are wonderful words that come up. I'm always a little concerned when I ask that open-ended question because of course appreciative inquiry is, is a, a, an unconventional approach to organization development as well as professional development. So we never know what might come up when people hear it. Today, I wanna to shine a spotlight on appreciative inquiry or AI for short, which as so many of you know, at its most concrete is a strengths-based methodology for change, yet quite fluid and improvisational, or it's a positive process or technique for innovating. Well, at its most abstract, it's a philosophy, a paradigm that sees the world in terms of assets, strengths, abundance. Appreciative inquiry seeks to build the future from that which gives our human system 
life. Seeing from an asset focus as opposed to a deficit view has been shown to be beneficial in so many ways, both in the workplace and beyond. In this very brief session, we will look quickly at a few benefits and some of the research that underpins them. I wanna recognize first the generous community of appreciative inquiry scholars and practitioners for their great works, which have been the inspiration for this content along with my own 18 years of practice, both as an AI facilitator, as well as a coach using the AI methodology with my clients. So let's begin here. Now, I want you to know I, I don't like to read my slides verbatim, but sometimes I do. And this is one of those times. So let me read this slide out to you as you let this language wash over you, really digest what this means to you. So a very foundational appreciative inquiry sentiment is that people and organizations are not problems to be fixed, but mysteries to be explored. So I have a rhetorical question for you to ponder, not just in this moment, but as we continue through the content today, what does this mean to you? Think about your interpretation of the content on this slide. Appreciative inquiry is, of course, as many of you know, foundationally grounded in scientific theory, such as the new sciences, like quantum physics, chaos theory, complexity theory, the power of positive image and visualization studies, social constructionism, mindfulness study, placebo studies, positive psychology and strengths-based psychology, the research of positive emotions, and the sociological construct of the Pygmalion effect. We also know from neuroscience how the brain responds to appreciative inquiry approaches with an outcome of results, collaboration, and creativity. Back in the 90s, when so many studies were looking at functional MRI uh, outcomes, we were able to map how the brain responds to both positive and negative. And this really underpinned the rigor of appreciative inquiry. Here's an emphatic reminder. Appreciative inquiry is not about the gap or what is missing. It's about leveraging the strengths inherent in the system towards whatever goal is identified. And that system can be a full organization, a division, a team, an individual. So here is an opportunity for me to gush a little bit. I'll get a little fangirl-like with you. You'll notice the academic definition here on the slide from our amazing conceptualizer, Dr. David Cooperrider, along with another brilliant co-developer, Dr. Whit Diana Whitney. And finally, you'll see Dr. Jackie Stavros, who refers to herself as the second generation of AI scholars because she was one of Cooper Ryder's students back in the 1990s. She has also added so much to the scholarship around appreciative inquiry, including co-designing the SOAR model. So let me read this out again for you so you can digest the language. What is appreciative inquiry? It's the cooperative search for the best in people, their organizations, and the world around them. It involves a systematic discovery of what gives a system life when the system is most effective and capable in economic, ecological, and human terms. 
So I want to give you a chance now to really dig into what do you think of this definition? What are your thoughts? What strikes you about this language in the chat? So what observations come forward, if you wouldn't mind sharing? And Stagan, as you can uh, watch along, maybe you'll tell us, are there any themes emerging from our learners' interpretations of this? So a few seconds as you type feverishly. What are you seeing, Sagan? Uh, I'm seeing reviving the system, uh, giving life, uh, being very collaborative, um, life or energy. I love that. Okay, I'm stalling here to give it uh, any more uh, moments for those of us who type slower. I'm also seeing comfort, assurance. Um, I'm seeing systematic curiosity and discovery. Good, I love it. I love it. That is. Those personal interpretations are all embedded in this very academic definition of what appreciative inquiry is. It's about energy. It's about satisfying that evolutionary need that we have to come together in collaboration it's about, as someone so eloquently put it, comfort. I mean, this is uplifting. This is uh, keying into a neural network that allows us to embrace learning and creativity is fostered. So wonderful, wonderful job learners. So, I know that many of you, if not all of you, are well familiar with the foundational principles of appreciative inquiry, but I want to go through these briefly in review because these are really the, the inspiration behind the benefits of appreciative inquiry. So many of us have a tendency to box appreciative inquiry into being just a process using frameworks like the five D's, the five I's, or, or even SOAR. It's the doing of appreciative inquiry. And certainly these models, these methodologies are part of the appreciative inquiry story, but it's far more expansive than a model or a methodology, isn't it? We can summarize the idea of being appreciative inquiry or applying appreciative inquiry to our perspective by unpacking these principles. So of course the constructionist principle is all about social constructionism. Right? How we come together to discuss our situation creates that reality for us. This purports that our destiny, our organizational destinies and our knowledge of the system are entwined. It reinforces whatever each employee thinks about their situation. It's truth for them. Perception is reality. And when we look at this, we recognize that we see things as we are in the moment. And the, the very elegant encapsulation of this principle is words create worlds. Words create worlds. Think about that. What does that mean for you? 
The simultaneity principle affirms that change is prompted by the intervention of inquiry. So simply taking action to ask a question is fateful. It puts us on a path and we live in the world that these questions create. Inquiry is change. It forever changes or impacts the system at hand. The idea that projection of a shared imagination or a shared vision can create the future is called the anticipatory principle. So this is really self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? It's so powerful, the visions, the visuals that we create in our minds about what's going to happen. So impactful to recognize that if those visuals are positive, it's compelling us towards them. But also, if those visuals are negative, it's certainly compelling us towards that direction as well. The poetic principle emphasizes the importance of storytelling as a method to gather organizational knowledge. As a species, we love stories. And it contends that the human system of an organization is responsible for interpreting its perception of said story. So together, the group steers that human system and is responsible for interpreting its perception. And the framing of those stories comes up so much based on what we're focusing on, not just as individuals, but as teams or organizations fully. And then finally, the positive principle is that notion that positive questions prompt effective and sustainable change efforts. And this, of course, comes to us via Dr. Barbara Fredrickson's brilliant work in positive emotion research. Her theory is the broaden and build theory of positive emotions. So, this principle is also about the power and the momentum of leveraging strengths as well. So now on the screen, these nation principles have more recently been articulated and are a vital aspect of the appreciative inquiry paradigm. So the whole systems approach is about honoring all the voices in the organization or the dialogue as systems thinking does. Plus, each of us is a whole person. So we bring that entirety of our being to the table with our lived experiences. The second emergent principle not only is talking about taking action, it's about embodying what you want to be, to try it on for size. Now, don't mistake what this means, though, I caution you. It's not suggesting that if you have a dream to be a surgeon, that you should sneak into an operating room tomorrow and just give it a shot. That's not what this principle is talking about. Instead, it's about shining a light on your, your presenting behavior, your affect, your posture, and your belief in your capabilities for what it is you want to be. The freedom of inner clarity allows us to per pursue freely. We have a choice. It liberates power. People perform better and are more committed when they have the freedom to choose how and what that looks like in terms of their contribution. The awareness principle is about surfacing assumptions or our underlying often 
uh, unspoken stories. This is critical in building strong relationships. This is reminding us to emerge those often unconscious metal models as uh, Dr. Peter Senge calls them through continually reflecting. And then finally, what's the story that we're all telling about ourselves, about our situations, about our organizations? Stories are transformational. We construct these stories about ourselves. And what's really interesting is to consider where did you acquire the narrative about who you are? So often in childhood, those around us, often well-meaning, sometimes not, will perpetrate a narrative upon us. And we embrace it as if it's the truth of who we are. So I'd encourage you to always examine the narratives that are operating for you. Do you own those? Did you write those narratives yourself or did someone else write them for you? So now that we've got the basics of appreciative inquiry sufficiently reviewed, I hope, let's take a look at why an appreciative inquiry lens can be beneficial. Again, I give all thanks and gratitude to the generous appreciative inquiry community, which is known for giving away their works and their thoughts and their wisdom. So I, I appreciate being a part of that community and am forever inspired by the scholarship that uh, the community is doing. So let's start here. An appreciative inquiry lens shifts energy. So for a moment here, I want you to conjure up a past failure that you've endured. So really get into that recollection. Walk through that in your mind. And as you're doing so, take note of kind of emotions come up for you when you think about this past failure. And this failure can be large or small, it doesn't matter, it just needs to be a failure that you've endured. So now I hope I've given you enough time to really get into that recollection. Is there anyone that would be willing to share some of the emotions with us that came up for you, that surfaced as you walked through this particular memory you have? Anybody willing to share emotions? Sagan, what are you seeing? In there. Um, Sandy writes, uh, feeling bad, shame, disappointment, regret, sadness, humiliation, yeah. stress, um, embarrassment, sure, demotivation, despair, mm. wow, distrust, self doubt. I'm so sorry I did this to you. We've got to shift that very soon here. But I want to say this, failure is scary. It's threatening, right? And did you notice how as Sagan was listing those emotions, you could almost effectively feel them yourself. I don't know if you noticed if I'm close enough to the camera, but my own face was in a grimace and I could feel what, what we were hearing. So now, shifting the energy, I want you to recollect a success that you've enjoyed, large or small, whatever it is, really sit with that recollection now for us. Note the emotions that are coming up. And, and as you anticipated this, I'm sure, I'd love to hear from you in the Q&A, what are those emotions? What's coming up for you? Capture some of those for us, Sagan. 
Um, I'm seeing confidence, relief, happiness, high energy, accomplishment, satisfaction, pride, exhilaration, elated, adrenaline, confidence, competent, successful, celebration, Love contributing it. to other success, oh, yeah. fulfillment, energy. Great. Great. Thank you for doing that for us. And thanks for sharing learners. I appreciate it. Did you notice a change in your posture, in your affect? I mean, it just felt like a collective sigh, I imagine. There was a calming, perhaps, that that overtook you as you listened to those emotions, as you yourself walked through that memory. Success is uplifting. It feels good, obviously. So when we ponder success, we're calm. We can think efficiently, effectively. When we ponder failure, it sets up our sympathetic nervous system to take control diverting resources from our brains to our bodies. It's that fight, flight, freeze, befriend response. Now let's talk about traditional problem solving. When a problem feels threatening or almost impossible, the process can leave people feeling like you described, de-energized, deflated, depleted, even lost. Maybe there's some hand wringing and woe is me going on. When a problem feels threatening or almost impossible, it's, it throws our brains into amygdala hijack, as it's known. We can't think straight because all of our resources are going to survival. And certainly we can't sustain that kind of energy output for the long run. With an appreciative inquiry lens, we investigate the positive opposite. So what do I mean by that? So we don't dive headlong into the problem right off the bat. We instead Look at the desired outcome, the desired end game. Now we're not ignoring our problems. We're simply coming at them from a different angle, a non-traditional angle. Thinking about our successes reminds us of our capability, our agency, our strengths. We anchor in what we do have, not what we lack. You likely sense appreciative inquiry's positive principle inherent in this benefit, which you'll recall, recall rather, is underpinned by Fredrickson's broaden and build theory. When we are freed into a climate of positive emotions, our brain switch into what's called the default mode network or the empathic neural network where creativity flourishes, where learning takes place. And our parasympathetic nervous system takes control, allowing our blood pressure to settle down, our hearts to pump normally, our breathing to level out, our digestion can begin when we're in that state of calm. Our body's resources go to our higher thinking region of the brain. To put this into play for yourself, think about how you can create situations in your life and at work, which prompt psychological safety and trust to allow you and others to perform at the highest levels, your best selves. Dr. Fredrickson recommends calling up a positive memory right before you go into a complex conversation or a situation or something very stressful. Bring back that memory 
of positive energy and it has a calming effect. Next, applying an appreciative inquiry lens positively influences culture. The underpinning of this benefit is primarily the constructionist principle, right? Social constructionism. The way we speak about, the language we use with each other creates the reality of our situation. As humans, we're drawn to stories, as I've said, and those narratives are crafted through the interpretation of events as each individual sees them. Can you hear the poetic and narrative principles in that statement as well? When we practice AI, the effects on the organizational culture are striking. With an AI approach to organization development, it's much easier to walk or talk, as one says, and to live our mission, vision, and values. We can we can connect the dots. Think about how you describe your own work culture. How do you add to the narrative, that organizational narrative that describes your workplace? One way to enact this, I came across in a, a publication called Focus on Women, and it's to use a knowledge transfer practice called One Minute Wisdom Bites where each team member gets one minute to share the most relevant and applicable information they have for the situation at hand or what they've learned post situation. Knowledge transfer reinforces cultural shift to more of a systems thinking approach and drives engagement and builds collegiality. So there's an element of the wholeness principle involved as well. Another idea that I like to use periodically is to switch into observation mode during work meetings or activities. Mindfulness and awareness, self-awareness play important roles in embracing appreciative inquiry. So I ask, what's my energy adding to this conversation right now? How am I adding to our desired outcome or how am I adding to our culture in this moment? How are my strengths showing up in a helpful and balanced way? This can be so instructive for me as I struggle with difficult situations. And obviously that's not something that uh, is easy for us to do in this fast paced society where so much is coming at us at any given time. It's hard to stave off that amygdala hijack. Certainly mindfulness practice of some sort can reinforce and buoy up your own practice of being able to stop, breathe, check in with yourself. An AI lens enhances engagement. Of course we know appreciative inquiry is a strengths-based approach. The easiest path to employee engagement is identifying, developing, and leveraging our innate talents or strengths according to decades of research at Gallup. This benefit correlates, of course, to the po positive principle, again, which emphasizes the idea that we're at our best, we're optimally functionally, when we can live inside positive emotions as well as our strengths. In an AI approach, we focus on what we have, our assets, our strengths, not what we lack. You're hearing a lot of repetition in what I'm saying. Additionally, everyone gets a chance to participate in the conversation if they wish. This sounds like wholeness principle once again. The Pygmalion effect shows up here as well. Our expectations of those around us come through our behavior and our treatment of them. Imagine 
how performance management could be positively affected if we applied an AI lens to it. In fact, think of the AI rendering of feedback. It's feed forward. Think about how your own performance looks when you're able to leverage your strengths and those of your team members. With an AI mindset, we are hopefully perpetually looking for strengths in action, effectively becoming a strengths spotter for others, as Dr. Jervis Bush calls it. We know that people who focus on their strengths every day have a six times uh, more likely report of being engaged at work. They're three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life. When teams focus on their strengths, every day productivity increases 12.5%. And when teams receive strengths focused feed forward or feedback, profitability increases by 8.9%. Further research has shown that engaged employees take fewer sick days than actively disengaged employees. Turnover decreases as well. Gallup has discovered that about 35% of US employees claim they're engaged at work. So there's a lot of room for improvement, right? And according to their ongoing longitudinal studies, again, Identifying and leverage strengths at work is the most effective way to engage our workers, as well as ourselves. Sadly, less than 20% of us have an opportunity to use our strengths on a daily basis. So think about how might you incorporate more of a strengths focus to positively impact your own engagement as well as your team members. An appreciative inquiry lens transforms conversation. Grounded in the poetic and simultaneity principles as well as awareness and narrative principles, this benefit anchors in the action of reframing and the directional nature of the questions we ask. Oftentimes in conversations, people will attempt to anticipate another's intent. And frequently that anticipation skews to the negative. We might tend towards the worst expectation. Our negativity bias does not serve us and that's what's happening there. Sometimes it does, certainly, in life or death situations, but some of the time it doesn't. So we're, of course, hardwired to default to that negative, that weakness, the deficit, the threat. And with an AI lens, we take the time to intentionally assume unconditional positive regard, to give another the benefit of the doubt, to find the sometimes hidden asset, to zoom out see the bigger picture of circumstances. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got excited. To stifle the rush to rash judgment. Additionally, we're quite well versed in exactly what we don't wanna see happen. And we tend to spin into that outcome. With appreciative inquiry, the language we use is not putting the other on a defensive track. It's not adversarial, it's open, it's inviting. Plus, we understand that our questions are fateful in setting us on a path. The minute we ask the question, the situation is pointed in that subject's direction. So with an AI lens, we remember to head in the direction of what we want instead of what we don't. So ponder how you might cue yourself when you're succumbing to your own negativity bias and turn that around. Mindfulness and self-awareness, again, can be so vital in recognizing this. 
So finally, living with an appreciative inquiry lens generates innovation. Skeptics who dismiss appreciative inquiry as fluffy, happy talk, lightweight Pollyanna, have not seen the power of generativity that can emerge from appreciative inquiry. Studies surrounding Fredrickson's bar, broaden and build suggest that, again, when we can work inside positive emotions, perspectives expand, we're more likely to accept differences, embrace new ideas, transform our outcomes. The climate of psychological safety that builds allows for creativity to flourish. We can think straight when our amygdala is not stealing our body's resources for survival. And the amygdala hijack is short-circuited by feeling positive emotions. The activation of that default mode network, that empathic neural network that I mentioned a minute ago supports not only creativity, but also psychological safety, which can look like bonding through the momentum of emotional alignment or emotional resonance as it's known in the research. Moreover, a strengths focus shows up prominently here. Dr. Cooper Ryder has so famously said that strengths not only perform, they transform. Leveraging our strengths allows for transformative outcomes, not just a restoration to the status quo that we might get in traditional problem solving and brainstorming. In addition to the positive principle, the other principle at work here is the anticipatory principle, the power of positive image, pulling us, compelling us towards it. If you can dream it, you can do it. Some of you might recognize this uh, famous quote, which is attributed often to the amazing Walt Disney, but apparently it was really said by Disney Imagineer Tom Fitzgerald. Think about it. That intense vision of the future empowers us to create the circumstances, the path to achieve it. Finally, organizational learning and innovation nest together. An AI lens is like an incubator for innovation. For those of you who can't seem to shake that evolutionary negativity that we all have in, in different aspects, but would still like to don the appreciative inquiry lens, Here's a list of reminders. Now understand that this first point here does not include blind optimism or toxic pos positivity. There's a balance that's needed here in understanding this. Finding the positive should never include dismissing anxiety, fear, real sadness. Healthy positivity is, as Dr. Martin Seligman explains, an understanding that there will be tough days or hardships and that eventually these will end. You'll make your way through to the other side. And you can see so much of this list is about being present in the moment or slowing down, mindfully recognizing who we're being in the moment. Master coach Carol Kaufman often asks a powerful question of her clients. And that question is, who do you wanna be right now? So I talk a lot. We've got one minute. <laughs> for a reflection. So hopefully my uh, course producers here will give us a little bit of extra leeway. But what I'd like you to do is conjure up quickly a minor challenge that uh, you're facing right now. Don't make it a huge challenge. We don't have that kind of time, right? But just 
Think of a minor challenge you're facing. Really get at some of those details of the situation. And then use these prompts to frame your reflection on this. So once you've uh, walked through this quickly, I'd love to hear from you what observations surfaced as you did this. So I'm not necessarily looking for any specifics about your minor challenge. I wanna know how did you respond to the reflection using these questions, right? Imagining the desired outcome, really getting clear on what it is you want, how, how the narrative shows up. Are there challenges to that narrative that you can make that will serve you better? How are your strengths showing up for yourself in this reflection? Is there a reframe? So despite the difficult nature of the challenge, is there something beneficial on the other side? What's the mental picture that you bring up in your mind's eye when you think about being on the other side? And then what learning emerges from this? So do I have two minutes to give them, Jenny and Sagan? Fingers crossed. Sure. Yes. Okay, yes, good. Your yes. Thank you. Take two minutes, ponder this quickly. About one more minute. And again, I'm interested in what observations are surfacing for you as you walk through this reflection. What's occurring to you? What's sparking? I'm seeing um, that a reframe can be very, very helpful. Instead of dread, there is excitement for learning. It's helpful to imagine and put words to a better possible future situation. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Generating more ideas, more possibilities. Good. Did anyone pick up their body response to this reflection? You know, was there attention? I would suggest probably not. Or was it just like a calm? Someone said an excitement, right? Kristen writes, uh, the feelings of dread or anxiety shifts to positivity and hope. Um, shifts focus from obstacles to strength and from fear to possibilities. I love that, gives me chills. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for for summarizing the comments, Sagan, and I will finish up and still allow a little bit of time for some Q&A with this last thought from the late and venerable Jane Magruder Watkins, who was in on the ground floor of this concept and continued throughout her life to add amazing scholarship to the field. And of course, our very own conceptualizer, our modern day progenitor of appreciative inquiry, Dr. David Cooper Ryder. Although it is from an article that was published in 2000, it really holds up. And it seems like the perfect conclusion to this session. 
So let me read this once again out to you. Appreciative inquiry seeks what is right in an organization. It's a habit of mind, heart, and imagination that searches for the success, the life-giving force, the incidence of joy. It moves toward what the organization is doing right and provides a frame for creating an imagined future that builds on and expands the joyful and life-giving realities as the metaphor and organizing principle of the organization. So with that, I will ask you to ask yourself, is this the lens through which you wish to see if you aren't? if you are not already seeing through this lens. So thank you so much for your attention and your participation in the Q&A. Uh, what questions do we see coming up? Sagan. Um, Rebecca asks, I'm wondering when you are in your curious inquiry mindset, do you have any favorite questions or prompts and what are they? Okay, so drawing upon my experiences, I use a lot of prompts like, ooh, tell me more about that. Or what else can you say about that? So things like that, that uh, help a person recognize your excitement, that you do wanna hear more, right? So it's affirming. Again, it's a reminder of sorts that they are a valuable contributor to the conversation. Thank you, Rebecca, good question. I'm sure if we had more time, we could talk at length about that. What else? Thank you. Um, Julie asks, are there industries that have embraced AI or is there any commonality in the types of organizations that are quicker to adopt? What might we learn from that to help organizations that are slow adopters? Sure, that, that is also a great question. So healthcare was certainly an early and frequent adopter of an AI approach. We also see surprising industries that embrace AI. And I'm thinking of uh, the Navy, for instance, I'm thinking of roadway trucking. I'm thinking of the manufacturing industry in terms of Green Mountain Coffee from a couple of decades ago. Uh, Amanda Trostenbloom's uh, fantastic intervention at Hunter Douglas, which is like a window treatment organization. We know that uh, appreciative inquiry has gotten some legs in community development. We know that it's been incredibly successful in school systems, in universities. Is there one particular uh, profile of an appreciative inquiry adopter? I would say probably not but recognizing that it is important always in any kind of organization development to have buy-in from the sponsor and leadership. They've gotta be bought into it. They've gotta be open to it at all times. So considering those types of things. When you think about someone like Jackie Kelm, who's a longtime contributor to the AI scholarship, Jackie comes from an engineering background. And maybe we might think that engineering doesn't sound like it would embrace appreciative inquiry. It's, I use that example as a way to say that it's really situational. It's based on the organization and the, the human system within the organization. So thank you for that question, Julie. Do thank we have you. any more time? Uh, yes, we have time for, I think, two more questions. Um, so Chietza uh, asks, how do you introduce AI in a largely negative environment? For example, an organization with demotivated employees. 
Wow. Yeah, so that is a difficult question that is not easily answered. I think bottom line to ask the sponsor is how can they heal the culture before introducing something like appreciative inquiry? So if there are those, those uh awful things that have happened, abuses or bullying culture, whatever it is, those have to be healed first. Otherwise, and this isn't the case across the board because every organization is different, but otherwise you run the risk of people just throwing up their hands and saying, there is no way I am participating in this fluffy talk when I've been abused for the last five years and my, my boss is uh, unethical or whatever it is, right? So really ask, is this something that is going to do no harm, right? It's almost like the medical field, right? Your goal is to do no harm. Then when you when you can assess, okay, I think that this is a system that is open to this. We could use the uplifting nature of an appreciative inquiry lens to help to heal the organization. Then you might have a window into going into it. You wanna be sure at all times that you're speaking the language of the organization or the industry, right? So there are certain organizations perhaps that are gonna be put off by the, the traditional appreciative inquiry language, right? Discover, dream, life-giving, right? That positive core that might not land the way we want it to land with every system. It's okay to alter the language that, that you're as a practitioner utilizing as long as you're not altering the intent and the method of, a, of doing appreciative inquiry, of the methodology. I hope that helps. Thank you. I think that that's all the time that we have for the question. So sorry. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Newhart for sharing knowledge, expertise, and wisdom with us today. If we didn't get to your questions, please feel free to send us an email or you can reach out to the presenter directly via email. On behalf of our ODNC program, we hope you found this webinar helpful. We would like to hear your feedback on our webinar series please take the survey using the link in the chat box. Our next webinar is about is an organization development approach to Lean Sigma appropriate by Dr. Wesley Donahue and Dr. Eric Bergestrom on July 30th from 12 to 1 p.m. Our webinar team will release a new webinar flyer and registration pages for all the rest of this year's webinar. We have an amazing lineup for this year. You will get all information about the upcoming webinars through your email soon. Thank you all for attending today and see you in the next webinar. Thank you, Dr. Newhart. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Sagan. Thank you, Sagan.